Um, so first things first, welcome everyone to our second session in our Intangible Matters online series in collaboration with EverEdge. First things first, housekeeping. Um, so this session will be around a presentation from our speakers followed by a Q&A by side chat. So I'll ask, I have muted everyone, but if you do come on, um, just keep yourself on mute. And once we get to that Q&A session, just um, you can either ask a question by raising your hand in the chat function and wait for either myself or Samantha Noon to call you out. Um, and then I'll just ask you to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Alternatively, you can just post your questions in the chat um, and we can ask it throughout the session. So my name's Dallas Pierce. I am the manager of Avocag at AgriFutures Australia. For those that aren't aware, AgriFutures Australia is a research and development corporation that proudly focuses on the future of Australian agriculture. And one such part of our really diverse portfolio is Avocag. Avocag is designed to connect the agri-food innovation community across the Asia Pacific and around the world. And we do this by having a digital platform that many of you would have um, jumped on when you were registering for this session. And we also have a premier agri-food tech event where farmers get to share their experiences, startups get to pitch their potential, scientists showcase their discoveries, global business leaders share their insights and industry experts debate, debate their opinions. So we're really excited to be hosting Evoke Ag again in 2022. And if you are an agri-food tech startup on the call, our applications are currently open for our Evoke Ag startup program, which will be our innovation station, which is our new look startup alley and the investor pitch dinner. So I definitely encourage you to hop on our website, evokeag.com and apply to it for the chance to join us at Evoke Ag. So while we're here today, I manage our Avocag startup program and I have had a lot of feedback from our founders um, that intangible assets is a really unknown territory for them and they really kind of wanted to, you know, get some advice from the experts, EverEdge, and also do a bit of a deep dive um, into case studies and that's why we've got people here like Ernie today from Rhino Rack. So I'll introduce our speakers and then I'll hand over to Tyler. So we've got Tyler Capson. Tyler is the Managing Director at EverEdge and specialises in corporate strategy, valuation and M&A transactions. Tyler has a significant international experience. He has helped to establish the company's Singapore office and its alliance with IPOS International, a subsidiary of the IP office of Singapore. So before, and before recently moving to the US to continue building EverEdge's North American footprint, so before joining EverEdge, Tyler worked in New York City for Deloitte and Goldman, Goldman Sachs, advising Wall Street banks and financial institutions, along with working with several really high profile transactions, including Facebook IPO and Apple Bond offering. Tyler is a certified patent evaluation analyst, a chartered valuer and appraiser and a registered management consultant. So thank you, Tyler, um, for joining us from EverEdge. And then we have our guest speaker today, which is Ernie Fernandez, who is the world's first Chief Intangible Asset Officer at Rhino Rack. Ernie attained an aeronautical engineering degree from Sydney Uni and has over 23 years of experience in the automotive industry in various roles as an engineer, project manager, sales and marketing manager, production manager, operations manager, and IP and legal officer. Throughout his career, Ernie has taken every opportunity to develop and hone his skills into the position of general manager of Rhino Rack. With his experience and wealth of knowledge across all facets of the industry, he's now moved into the chief intangibles asset officer and has identified the true hidden value within Rhino Rack. So thank you both for joining us. And again, we will have questions at the end. So if you think of any throughout um, the presentations or our questions with Ernie, just pop them in the chat and I can bring them up at the end. So thanks everyone for joining and I'll hand over to you, Tyler. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dallas. I appreciate the, the introduction and uh, I appreciate the, the invitation to really be, um, I guess, to join this group and to have some time to present and, and, and talk a little bit more about valuation. Um, so I think as we start, I mean, uh, I, really, I do want to spend some time talking with Ernie about his experience and uh, w with Rhino Rack. Um, but th this series, because it is around intangible assets and um, that, that's kind of the focus, if, if you haven't joined in, in some of the earlier ones, you know, the, the, the premise kind of starts um, around the movement of the market from tangible assets to intangible assets. And, and, and the chart that I have up is a snapshot of the S&P 500 in terms of value. And over the last 40 years, you see there's been a complete inversion from tangible assets and into 
into intangible assets. And so really, this is the, you know, the, uh, the asset class that we're going to be talking about. And um, for those of you who do not know who EverEdge are, we are an intangible asset specialist. Um, we've got offices in Australia, New Zealand, the US. And um, when people ask me, well, what does that mean to be an intangible asset specialist? We, we, I've narrowed it down to explaining what I do in, in a very simple process. And in short, I help companies to identify the intangible assets that are in their business as a starting point. Then secondly, once you know what you have, we help them to identify the, the risks that are inherent with those assets and to help them reduce uh, any risk possible. Once you've eliminated the risk, you then start to look at, okay, where does the value sit? And you start to put price tags on things, okay? And when, once you know what you have and what it's worth, you can start to do something with it. it might be go out to market and sell it or license it or, or partnership or, or use it for growth. And, and when we're talking about assets, we're talking about all types of intangibles within the business. We're talking about brands and content, internet assets and patents, designs, anything that you can't touch that is kind of like the blood inside of a business with good bones, but it helps everything move around. And so when we talk about intangible assets, people sometimes go, well, you know, depending on what area or, or sector of the business you're in, you may actually refer to these as something else, but you're already working with them. And so you know, to, to break down, making sure that everyone is using the same language and verbiage, um, we really look at any of the re assets that help to drive margins and market share. You know, it is an example of this. If you talk to a lawyer, they might call it intellectual property or, or an accountant. They might refer to it. Oh, our intangible assets are on the balance sheet under goodwill. But if you talk to someone who is strategic and they might say, well, that's our competitive edge. So any of those types of comments, they're most likely referring to intangibles because those are the those are the assets that affect margins and market share. Now, just to prove how important this is and, and, and the movement around this, and we are going to talk about valuation today. So let's start with the valuation of market of, of large corporations and the market cap today. If you look at the five most valuable companies, um, collectively, their value is worth about $4.6 trillion. But from an accounting standpoint, if you look at the balance sheets, they actually only report $228 billion in assets. So everything else therefore must be the intangible asset value. So this isn't just theoretical, this is proven by some of the largest companies in, in the world. And, and the thing that is ironic about it is even though we know that the, the value sits in intangible assets now, a majority of companies still spend an inordinate amount of time to track the chairs and laptops and have a fixed asset register and um, it, it, into assets that don't necessarily tie direct back to value. Uh, we, I worked with a company that um, spent time putting, you know, labels on all the artwork throughout the building. I mean, you know, you're talking about pictures that might be worth, I don't know, $100. They're like a print in a, in a cheap frame. Um, but yet they, they weren't as concerned about, well, who are the key people in the business that we can't let leave the hallways or leave the business? So it was a very, very interesting conversation. Um, and so when, when we see this and we see that people aren't connecting really the value of the business into these intangible assets, you know, we say, look, you've got your eyes in the wrong place. You're focusing your time and attention in the wrong place. So we're, we're going we're gonna to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the theoretical and give a couple of case studies. And then Ernie is going to actually go into um, his experience through this actual process. And from a valuation standpoint, most valuers, I'm a chartered value and appraiser, and most people understand valuation as, as, as a simple process and more like an accounting process. And, and most people will say, well, there's three kind of primary approaches to, to do a valuation on a company, a market approach, uh, an income approach, and a, or an asset-based approach. Um, and so when you take those different approaches and, and look at them from an accounting standpoint, um, you say, oh, well, that, 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 that seems really easy to do, and they can put value on a company. <clears throat> but what they miss is the intangible assets don't always get fully fleshed out 
in these methods unless they are to brought into focus. Now I'll explain the, the, the mechanic and the, you know, the sort of the mechanics of, of building up a valuation. Okay. So if I'm a valuer, I'm going to start and, and I value a, a, a company. I'm going to look at what fixed assets and cash they have first, because that's really easy. I know if they've got, you know, a million bucks on their balance sheet, I know they're worth at least a million bucks because that's one for one. Then you look at the other things like fixed assets. Okay. Pl property, plant and equipment, inventory, those types of things. And, and that is, is, a, is an easy place to start. The next place you, that you look at is the cash flows. Okay. How much is the business actually generating? And when you look at, at that, you do what's called in the, in the valuation space, a discounted cash flow model. And you've probably done them if you've gone to business school or finance classes. Um, but basically you put some sort of a multiple on, you know, that overall value of, of the cash flows and what it's worth today. And you add that all up and you get a, a basic um, value for a company. Now, what this misses is strategic value in businesses. And when you apply intangible assets, it starts to move the needle significantly. Um, because what is valuable to me may not be the same value that you have. Um, and a very good example of this is Instagram. Now, Instagram, okay, um, when they were only two years old, this is back in 2012, they were acquired by Facebook, okay, for a billion dollars. Now, from a incomes perspective, they still had zero revenue at the time. So they kind of broke the laws of, of traditional valuations. They had no assets. They had no revenue. So why was Facebook willing to pay a billion dollars? Now, the story behind that is maybe just as interesting as just the facts. Um, <laughs> it, it goes that Instagram was in meetings. Facebook came and offered them $500 million. And, and uh, Instagram turned them down. And from an accounting standpoint, you'd go, wow, they, they're crazy. From a numbers perspective, they, they, they're crazy to do this. Um, but then shortly after they were turned down, the, the next offer was a billion dollars. And of which, of course, they, they took that. And Facebook has done very, very well uh, in that acquisition. Now, the strategic value to Facebook was, was much higher than it would be for someone like me that doesn't have the platform to be able to actually do anything with those assets. And when you look at assets like this that can scale, in contrast to maybe a, 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 a company that is mostly physical assets, this is a company called Main Freight. They're a logistics provider in the United States and, and actually worldwide. Um, from a valuation standpoint, they have a billion dollars in revenue every year. They have two billion in assets on the balance sheet. They have six thousand plus staff, um, and they're you know forty years old now. So their price tag in terms of their market cap is also one billion. But they're the same value as as Instagram was at, at the time. And one of the major reasons for this is because tangible assets can't scale at the same speed and the same rate that intangible ones can. And so if you look at the, the, the chart that I have up around companies and how long it took them to actually reach a billion dollars in market cap, you'll see the ones on the right are typically more intangible asset heavy companies, okay? Platform-based, user-based, subscription-based, um, you know, not, not um, brick and mortar-based or, or geography-based. And, and so, when we talk about valuations, even though we've seen this, we've proven that the old valuation methods can be broken multiple times uh, or, or can be broken in the right circumstances. It's very interesting when I talk with growth companies that would like to use debt to continue to grow. And they say, well, you know, the, 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 the banks aren't lending to us um, because our cash flows aren't, 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 aren't strong enough. And they want to see that we have assets on the balance sheet that, to back those up. They want collateral. They want, you know, personal guarantees as an example. And I'm going to give a simple example of why banks are still missing the point with valuation. Now, <clears throat> this is a, a simple, simple scenario, but let's say you've got two companies. All right. Company A um, decides to 
build a company from scratch and they spend $10 million on R&D. Let's say it's a company like RhinoRack, okay? Someone wants to build a competitor to RhinoRack. Ernie, don't worry, I'm not planning on it, but you know, we'll... Uh, <laughs> Um, the point of this is, let's say they spend $10 million to build, a, to build the company, okay? They spend money on R&D so that they can manufacture, you know, accessories for vehicles, truck parts, truck, truck additions, and things like that. Company B opts to do the same thing, but instead of doing it, they actually um, purchase Rhino Rack instead for, say, $10 million. Now... The difference is that the company A, well, they'll show their growth pattern and it, all of those expenses through the P&L, and it, it depresses their earnings. Whereas company B, if I just go and buy Rhino Rack, I get to then attribute all of that value that I paid, the $10 million that I paid, onto my balance sheet. Now, if you look at those at, a, at, the, at the point in time, now company A and company B are at the same point. They're both producing products. They're both generating revenue and they should be worth relatively the same. But from a banking perspective and a, and a balance sheet perspective, company A looks like it is actually underperforming to company B because of the way that they have grown their company. So when you look at valuation and you look at growth, uh, one of the questions that I have in the back of the year is to ask, you know, is it, should we be capitalizing our spend in terms of our, our growth and um, you know, our R&D? and you know, creation of new products and designs, um, or should we expense it, okay? And that can be very, very different depending on, on your, um, your growth plan and, and what your future exit plan is. So when people ask me about valuing intangibles and in valuing businesses, um, they say, well, I, I kind of get what you do and I kind of understand it, but you know, can you give me an example? And so I say, well, one of the most easiest ones to do now is actually data, okay? And I'm gonna just talk a little bit about data valuation because it's, a, it's an easy concept for everyone to understand. Most people have data in their business. Um, most of the largest companies today are actually data, data companies, not necessarily product companies. And um, two quick case studies around this that, that show this importance. Caesars Palace um, in the great financial crisis, they went through bankruptcy and the liquidators through the process um, they sold off the buildings, they sold off, you know, all the, the, the tables and the furniture and, and that kind of thing. One of the assets that wasn't listed on their um, fixed asset register was their players program. And when you go into a casino, you sign up for a player program, you give your name and address, and they give you, you know, $50 in table credit to, to gamble away. And um, when the players program was then valued later by Harvard Business Review, it was valued at over a billion dollars. And it would have been the highest single asset on that fixed asset register. But the liquidators didn't actually take the time to sell it. Um, in fact, even today, this case is still in court proceedings um, because of the oversight of that process. Um, that's a negative side when somebody missed out the value of, of data and value. And uh, one side where we're probably very more familiar on so similar types of data sets is, is Qantas Airlines. They have a very, very good... Um, frequent flyer program. And back in the 2000s, during the time when they were really struggling, they were having a hard time making money from flying people around the world. And you know their main business, which is airplanes, they um, were making less money from the airline business than they were from their points program and the associations that they had it. They're, they had, so during that time, um, the points program was valued at over half of the entire airline. And it actually helped them, uh, you know, to to stay afloat. So, when people ask me, okay, well, so how do you value data? Well, I can tell you very, very quickly, you know, quick quick pieces of well, I can tell you how not to, and some of those are are, are quite easy. And in the I see these types of comments all the time, such as, well, we've got a lot of data in the business, and we've had it for a long time, so it must be worth something. Um, or, well, I I, I buy leads. And so each of those leads cost me $10. I've bought X amount, so therefore $10 times X amount of leads, th those have got to be valued to me. I've got the name and email address of every lead that I've purchased. Um, you know, but really when you look at, at something like data and, and most intangibles, okay, not just data, but 
they really are an asset that have to be identified, well understood, and it has to be, in the case of, of data, this quote around crude oil brings it to light very, very, very strongly. Data is just like crude. It's valuable, but if it's unrefined, it cannot really be used. It has to change into gas, plastic, chemicals, et cetera, to create a valuable entity. That drives profitable activity. So must data be broken down, analyzed for it to have value? So most intangibles, they need to be broken down, analyzed uh, for it to have value. So the process that we go through is simply that. We, we, we take an intangible asset, such as data, we identify the use case around it, and then we start to look at how does this actual use case work in an actual business model, okay? Um, once you see the business model around it, you start to build the, the, the costs and the benefits associated with that. And, and what you're doing is you're building these use cases um, that can then be valued individually instead of the entire data set. Uh, at Everage, we call this the DAISY model. And you first have to start off by looking at the, the, the quality of the data. Same as crude oil. If you've got bad quality, bad product in, you know, you can't do anything with it. Um, good data in has to make sure that you can use it from a technical factors uh, or from a, from a technical review. You need to make sure that you can understand it and see it and review it. You need to understand that you have to have the legal rights to use it. You know, just because you collect someone's information doesn't mean you can turn around and sell it to somebody else. So there's legal factors around it, and then there's risk factors. That helps to set up sort of a quality rating, which then you build those business cases off of it. Um, so, I mean, simple example. Let's say I've got traffic data uh, for a city. If it's good quality data that's reliable, um, well-maintained, and uh, the data set is, is clean, then I can use it. If it's anonymized and it's not specific driver's license numbers or you know, license plate numbers, then legal, I probably don't have any issues using that. Um, and then you look at the risk factors. You know, should I use this or could I end up causing more accidents or any liabilities if I do use this? So if all of those check out, you say, great, let's build a use case off of this. I can use my traffic data to help um, reroute traffic jams around a particular city or, or maybe around a specific sporting event where it will be very, very busy um, or around a school at peak hours. So that might be one business case unit that I could then sell or license that data to a particular uh, party. Once you've done that work to identify that business case and identify the strategic costs and benefit, you end up with a particular a, a value against that business case. And once you build these up, you end up with multiple business cases. So that's one example of, of valuing something like data. Um, now that might be, be too technical for today's discussion, but I think it's important to see, you know, how it actually works and in, in the in the kind of the 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 little steps that go into building it. Um, now I, I've valued many many companies in, in my day, and um, I love working with companies that are, you know, from a tech standpoint, or I've even done valuations for a banana plantation in the Philippines that was as low tech as you can get. Um, and so uh, let me provide a couple of examples of, of some case studies that were, that were actually quite good. You know, we work with a company called Air Trunk, and um, this is about five years ago. Um, they, they brought us a, a technology that they were building and it was a way to, to design and build data centers that save significant amount of, of power consumption in the build. And um, we recognized that it was critically important that how they did this, how they maintained that trade secret and that intangible assets of how they were going to build this was critical. So we said, look, you shouldn't go out and patent this. You don't want to tell the world what you're doing. We created a strategy for them. And then we did a valuation of which um, we, we valued them at about $80 million. We, they, that valuation was picked up by JP Morgan, who underpinned the raise. I think the first round, they ended up raising $100 million. And then through the entire process over five years, they ended up uh, raising over $400 million in equity. And they were extended a, a $750 million debt facility from Goldman Sachs to continue building data centers using this technology. And um, January of last year, um, they actually sold a majority of, of the business to Macquarie Bank for $3 billion uh, Australian dollars. So 
um, the valuation components can be very, very important because had that not been right in the first place, they might have never gotten the business off to start with. Um, and another um, interesting thing when we talk about valuations and you look at your own businesses, a lot of people look at joint ventures or partnerships as, as a growth lever. Now, we worked with a company, um, THL is a listed travel company. Uh, they were working with a, a U.S. company called Thor that owns the brands um, like Winnebago, Campermate, uh, Airstream, if you're familiar with any of those. And they wanted to go in and do a, a joint project where they were going to use THL software and, and, and platforms. And um, they were going to enter into a 50-50 JV. And they value this at $50 million. Now, THL um, were contributing majority of the intangibles to this J JV. And so we ended up doing a specific valuation just on the intangible assets and, and provided that back to the, uh, to the Americans. And we had to walk through the report to explain why each of the intangibles was so valuable. When they read through it, they, they said, well, each of these intangibles that you've called out is the reason we want to do this JV. So look, you cover your operating costs uh, locally and we'll cover the rest of the cash as needed. So we ended up saving them $22 million in cash and the, the, the deal stayed as a 50-50 joint venture. Um, now, um, we don't always save everybody that much money, and that's an extreme example, which is, of course is why we use it as a case study, because it really, it really accentuates the fact. But um, a, a fun one that I worked on in, in Australia is you know, with, a, with a group out of the United States. This was a few years ago. Um, it was called Agent Box, and, and they were approached by Excel KKR to San Francisco to acquire the business. And um, at the time, they were going through the process, and they requested an uh, evaluation from Everedge and and I, I sat down with the the CEO and the CFO we we broke down the business and we outlined you know where the value was in their intangible assets and the initial offer that came came from from the VC group out of out of San Francisco um they said look you know we're going to offer about 3 to 4 times sales in this deal um maximum we provided a valuation report that put the valuation closer to eight times sales. And <laughs> when we provided this, um, the, the KKR came back and, and said, I, I remember getting a phone call from the CEO. And uh, he said, Tyler, I, I think you just blew up my deal. And I said, well, how come? He said, well, they said we're, we're way too expensive and they, they don't think we can deal with us if we're this expensive. And I said, well, let's walk through the valuation report. And you tell them where, you know, have them tell us where we got it wrong. Because, yeah, you know, there's always give and take in evaluation and not be some things we were right, some things we were wrong. But let's let's have them tell us where they think we've got it wrong. Well, we did that. We went through the we went through the document and they ended up settling for 7.4 times sales. Um, so a little bit of movement there, but but all in all, a, a really, really good outcome. And again, the thing that moved the needle or that, that moved it from the three to four times initial offer was, was identifying the intangible assets. So um, hopefully, you know, the, the, this has been helpful to see some valuation experiences, you know, in real life, some case studies. Um, and these are sort of secondhand, you know, uh, I was involved with these, but, um, you know, from a, from a valuer standpoint. And, you know, you know Ernie with Reinerak has been through it firsthand. Uh, you know, from from the seller standpoint. Um, so uh, I think as he will probably have a better better question set than I do. But if you're just starting out on this this journey, you know, what are some of the questions that you should ask about your company, your intangible assets, and, and your own corporate value? Um, these are some great places to start. You know, how do I unlock? you know, value from my intangibles or how can I maximize the, the company value in a joint venture or, or in a capital transaction? And, you know, what should I look out for when I'm planning to go overseas? You know, valuation and, and growth are, are very, very inter intertwined. So just some, some interesting questions that you should be asking your CFO. If you are the CFO, asking the CEO from a strategy standpoint. So just my last five tips appreciate everybody you know here you know <laughs> taking the time with me hopefully you've got something out of this my five little points that i'm going to leave on this in terms of to 
help you articulate your company value if you're going through an exit, if you're looking to sell your business, or if you're raising capital for a capital event, which are kind of you know very, very common uh, events for, for, for growth stage companies. First thing is I always tell people is, look, you need, and it should be clear, this is the number one, identify the key intangibles in your business. Know your full business value, you know, going into all your discussions, okay? If you don't know what you're worth, you're not going to get the value, you know, and if you don't make the case, they're not going to see it. So you're not going to get what you need. You know, second one is create a story about the unique features of the business um, so that they remember and they understand why the intangibles play a role in the business and they have to be transferred to the new company. Um, that, that, that plays a significant part of increasing the value so they understand why they need it and they can't just rebuild it or they can't just buy somebody else like you. They have to buy you or they have to invest in you specifically now. Um, the third one is, you know, be prepare early. If you are going to a capital event or you're looking to exit, you know, create a data room, you know, do your due diligence, have a valuation ready to go so that when they come in and they say, well, you're raising how much money or you want how much money for your business? You've got documentation. You've got something to back it up. You can say, well, we've worked with this provider. We've worked with this, this group. Um, and, and we've got this data room ready and it's all available for you to check out. If you're going, well, I'll get that to you in a few weeks or, you know, be prepared, be ready, be organized. What this does is called the anchoring effect. Okay. You've probably heard about it in business school, but when you are the first one to put a number out, it starts the discussions typically at that point. And you say, well, we want X amount of millions right now for our capital raise, or we'll take a minimum of X for the value of the company. It helps to set that bar and set the discussions at that point. And you can, if you're ready, prepared, and organized with defendable arguments, you are the one in control of those, those discussions and you can anchor the price. Um, number four is probably the most important. And when you're talking through how much to give away for your business or when you're looking at a, a, an exit and you're looking about selling your business, the strongest thing you can do is keep changing the conversation to one of from away from one of cost, which is more accounting and well, it's going to be a multiple of this number or multiple of that number. It's an EBIT multiple or a sales multiple, or yes, that is how most valuations end up or most you know, valuers talk or um, acquires look at the business because there's accountants involved to make sure the numbers all line up. But if you leave them to have that discussion, you end up lowering the bar to only a numbers discussion. Translate that discussion to one of value. Keep the discussion coming back to the intangibles. Yes, but the valuation is X because of our people, our culture, our processes. And those aren't going to be really seen from the, from the multiples. And look, at the end of the day, if you can't get the deal you want, if it's not working, you can always retreat, come back again, prepare yourself better, and, and go out to market a different way. So, um, Look, hopefully that, that was helpful. If you want more information around the uh, intangible asset valuation, um, please drop me an email. I can send you my direct contact information as well if you'd like um, to have a quick discussion on this. And, um, you know, happy to walk through any specific questions as well. Hopefully there's questions at the end. So I've taken up enough time um, and, and I am interested to hear about Ernie's journey and, and the one with Rhino Rack and how they went through the process. And, um, you know, how it can, how it is similar to what I've talked about and how it might differ. Um, so, um, uh, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll go thanks. ahead and pass it, pass it over to, uh, back to you, Dallas. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tyler. Um, it's a lot of information and, um, uh, I have questions, so many questions already, and we already have questions in the chat, but we'll throw to Ernie because I mean, I'm super keen to hear Ernie, you're the world's first chief intangible assets officer. That's a big title. Um, but I want to know the journey that you've, you've worn many hats in, as I mentioned um, earlier, I want to know that journey of, you know, the challenges and the learnings and, you know, what, what it took to get you to that kind of position at Rhino Rack. Yeah, well, thanks again, uh, Dallas, uh, for the intro and, uh, and Tyler and uh, re really uh, good information. I mean, I've seen this introduction um, from Michael and the team at Everidge just several times, and I can't help always taking notes because you always miss something, right? Um, and a lot of the things there, it, to try and unpack that 
for everyone in, in, in such a short amount of time. I'll do my best. Um, and again, that's why I think it's important if anything comes to mind and then shoot some questions. Um, but uh, I guess I'll go back to where Reinerak was at about five years ago. And uh, we all lived in, a, in, in several buildings uh, in Rotherwing. The business was expanding year on year when I joined and I've been with the business just over 10 years now. And um, and we'll we'll at a point where we're quite inefficient in being in so many different sites because as a small business you start to grow and you just you know lease another building next door and um, and then you just keep adding and you add more departments and all those kind of growing pains that uh, small businesses start to transition to as they become a more of a prominent player in the market and uh, and I had just taken over as the general manager back then and. The whole discussion was about, you know, safety. Safety is the number one important topic um, in, in business and making sure you protect your, your key assets, which are your people. And Everidge turned up in uh, to our office and uh, introduced me to this whole idea about how you manage your intangibles. Well, first of all, what are they? Um, and I worked very closely with IP Solve for many years, over 20 years now. And I looked after the, the IP portfolio, the trademarks, the application for, um, for uh, patents and design registrations, um, which is just something that fell in my lap years ago. And I had some idea of the value of those things, of course, in protecting your position in the marketplace in terms of product and how you could set certain pricing um, by putting a bit of a halo around your product range. But that was kind of like the extent of my, my knowledge. Um, and then when I've, I met Everidge, they gave me the introduction and I thought, wow, there's so much more to this. There's, there's priceless, there's bill of materials, there's customer information, there's databases. And obviously I had a bit of a brain explosion, but at the same time I had all these operational challenges. Um, and one of them, and the key one was we had to move. Um, and so I said, look guys, this sounds really, really interesting. And uh, but I just don't have the headspace for it. <laughs> so, so we put that off and I said, how about you come and see us Two years later when we actually get to move into one facility and we weren't just moving down the road we we're, were building a bespoke building um in a in a greenfield site that had no roads and so it was a quite a major project that went over 18 months roll the clock forward everage came back after we moved um and um did the introduction again and uh and then i said well we're ready um for this next phase um in our development but to be honest, it was something that was as important back then as it is today, because if I had my time again, I would have prioritised as, as much as uh, the move to our new facility in Eastern Creek. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> um, everyone's gone through that, 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 that question where who are the key people that you need in your business? Who do you have to hold on to that have got a particular bit of knowledge? It could be in your finance team. It could be in your R&D team. It could be in your production team. It could be a particular worker that has a particular way that they do things. All these things are what is encompassed in the foundation program, which identifies those key intangibles. And it is it was so important, and you did it by default uh, in the end, that you said, well, we better document this stuff because if such and such goes on leave or um, we're in the middle of the relocation, who do we talk to? Who are the contacts? Like even who are the contacts for your service providers? They're all key intangible pieces of information and they need to be owned by the business and we didn't know them. Some of this stuff was held in people's phones, for instance, um, or as photos. And so we quickly identified after we had our second session with, uh, with Everidge how important these pieces of information which are entitled under the intangible asset. And so that's where the journey really started to take effect for me, where the penny dropped. And then the second challenge was to actually bring the whole leadership team on board and get them to listen to what this meant and how this um, should be part of their, their role and how they need to contribute in terms of um, identifying these key assets. And of course, that was the biggest challenge. OK, so I, I, I got it. Um, and I also went to a few uh, presentations um, that I was invited to. So I had a bit of a knowledge uh, backing and and uh, obviously I started to understand this, the true value 
uh, which was described today. So that's the second part. How do you engage your team? And that's where that's where the challenge lies. OK, and so I remember in this new building that I'm in right now, right underneath the 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 the, the, the steps uh, from the first level, having a debate with the CEO at the time saying this is as important as the budget discussion we're going to have next month. I really need two hours in this half day session to talk about intangibles. And he actually asked me to uh, mind my manners <laughs> back then and say, this this can't be more important than a, than a budget discussion. And I said, well, I actually think it's more important than the budget discussion. I think it should be the first topic that we talk about with the entire team. In the end, uh, I got an hour. And so Michael and his team for Enverich came in and that was an eye opener. For some, you had your two sides of the camp and I'm not going to name them, but you guys can work out the highly regulated teams. Uh, who would say, well, that's goodwill. Yeah, we know that. That's that's the goodwill stuff. OK, then we had the other side of the camp, which included the owner of the business, which said, holy, hold on, bill of materials, you're absolutely right. If we don't have those bill of materials recorded somewhere, then how do we make our stuff? And then that led to the, well, the, the bill of materials make up one part of it, but how do you actually put the stuff together? Those processes that we built over years and refined and, you know, other quality systems around and uh, IT support and how the how the how the um, how the equipment that we use checks all this so that we, we we produce a reliable product. That process, that knowledge, how how is that documented? Who owns that? And we said, oh well, that's sitting in such and such as phone. It's just the photo. But who owns the phone? Well, he owns the phone. And you can see how this perpetuated into a, a very deep and uh, deep discussion, quite a concerning discussion that here we are, you know, a, a hundred plus million dollar business and some of our staff on their private phones have got the assets, the, the crown jewels, which should actually be living in Rhinorak. And that was the moment. That's when it actually made sense. And obviously then it's about how do you then bring the rest of the business along that journey to start that, 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 uh, uh, that process of identifying what are the important intangibles that today we just take for granted. And so many people take, so many businesses take that for granted. And 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 this is an ongoing process. Um, and Tyler, you talked about being ready. Um, we thought we were ready in terms of having a great facility, having brand new forklifts, having uh, compliant uh, racking, uh, having the right pallets. They're all the stuff that you can touch and feel and see. But what about the underlying stuff? What about the, the file structure in your business? How many of you have employed a new, a new employee into your business and the first thing they do is they open up a filing structure called Ernie? And in that, they start putting all their documents in there or they start creating new documents that make a, a particular process more efficient, but it sits in their filing structure. This is a real example. Okay, I've got it. I've got one. And then I go on leave, and by the way, I protected that file so no one can get access to it. And I go on leave for a month and someone needs that particular process, now they can't access it. Or better still, I resign. And my folder gets archived by HR. And the new person comes along and says, how did you do that? Oh, Ernie used to do that. How did he do it? Oh, I'm not sure how he did it. Where's his stuff? Oh, well, well, we archive this folder, but we don't even know what's in it. But doesn't marketing own some of the stuff? Didn't he? Wasn't he in marketing? Wasn't he in OEM? Wasn't he the intangible guy? You can see where I'm going with this, right? And that's just a very basic uh, example. This stuff exists in all businesses. And, um, and like you heard today, it's about going through the process of identifying those assets. And when you do that, it starts to open your mind and say, well, you know what? It's not the building that's important. Yes, they have. there's importance. You have to have a facility that you can operate. But all this stuff that makes that facility work is as important. And I think it's actually more important because the stuff that you don't see is the stuff that allows you to scale. So I can simply, and we're into product. 
Okay, Reinerag um, is in the business of making, designing, making and delivering product. How do I scale Reinerag into the North American market? And it's not just opening up a new facility. It's about what are my processes? What systems and processes do I use today that I can transfer over to that North American market? And I'll give you an example. The new product development process, we didn't have one. How many people have been uh, involved in a discussion with engineering or a product manager, and you're just basically putting all these ideas on the table? How is that all captured in terms of how do we filter it through? So we spent considerable amount of time developing a eight stage gate process, not something that came from a textbook, something that works for Ronorak, for our products, for our customers. You can't find that. You have to develop it. So who owns it? Is it the product manager or is it the business? Where's it stored? How's it backed up? Who gets access to it? Is it protected? Because I think I heard Tyler say that he was going to spin up a roof rack company and he's going to invest 10 million bucks. I can tell you now that you've got access to that MPD process. He's halfway there. OK, the second part is if he gets access to my database. And my contacts and the other part of it is if he gets uh, access to my manufacturers. So. When you start to identify how important those assets are, then your business starts to change gear. The focus changes. And I can tell you going through the process of the acquisition um, and we're in our fourth month of the trans transition. These are the discussions that we were having with our with our buyer. How do we scale? What is it that Reinerick has that allows this business, the new buyer to pay a multiple that will allow them to scale. And it was all about the intangibles. And those intangibles come from your people, from your culture. So we run on the five imperatives, right product, right service, the most appropriate technology for the time, not the latest, because it's got to be reliable, okay? Systems and a process-based approach Reducing and understanding variation in your business. You want to have a simple business. Tyler mentioned it. Be ready. Have your stuff ready in a in a data center so it's easy to find. It's structured like the filing system we talked about. It's good practice anyway. It's efficient. It reduces variation. You can scale your team because they can find the process. They can find your files. They're not owned by the last employee. It's shifting that mindset. So even your onboarding process changes. Here's your roadmap. This is how you operate at Reinerac. Here's your, here's your book. Your job as an employee is to create more intangibles for our business. That's what your role is. But they're stored at Reinerac. They're not stored on your thumb drive. They don't leave on a thumb drive. And having your contracts tight, watertight, so that they're aware what their obligations are as an employee. These are those things that give you a high performing business. And so I can't emphasize how important um, that was. And that, that wasn't an, an, an easy thing to get across. But I can tell you now that when we talk about assets, uh, we don't talk about goodwill uh, or um, um, other terminology. We use throughout the business intangible value. And I can tell you that competitive edge is all linked. And we've been doing research with uh, the University of UTS, and they wanted to publish a paper on the research we've done and what we've uh, been able to um, develop in order to streamline our testing procedure on vehicles. Guess what our answer was to, uh, to the university? You can't publish that. It's in our agreement because they're our trade secret. We use them to develop it, but we're going to hold on to that. If we hadn't known the value of these assets, we may have gone down a different path and thought that's great. Uh, pub uh, that's great publicity for Iraq to be able to release the paper and the university talks about how we came about uh, using our data that we've collected over 25 years to translate that into a, a, a test method that, by the way, 
turned um, the validation process from a two week period in a different country to an eight hour session in a laboratory. How much value is in that? How important would that be for Taylor to know that as he spins up his new roof rack company? And, and by the way, who to go to to get that information? So um, really important for those businesses, and I heard that there's some people from, uh, that may be listening who are scientists and, uh, and have some, some new ways of uh, creating a particular product. Um, it's not just the ingredients that's important. It's the process in terms of turning that ingredient into a product that your market wants and gives you that competitive edge. And they're the sort of things that you have to educate your entire business that they don't, they stay within your business because that's where the true value lies. It's not in the facility, not in the machinery. It's those processes that lie with within the business. Anyone can produce another machine to do the same thing, but how you run that machine is what gives you that edge. And so I can't emphasize enough how important it is to start with, first of all, identifying what those assets are and using someone like Everage uh, to help you or guide you through that, unlock that knowledge, because it's there. If you're in business today, it's because you're offering something that market wants. And then obviously being able to scale. So if you're intending on um, partnering up through a JV or selling off the business, your buyer wants to know how they can scale it to get that true value that they're looking for. And that's where the basis of the conversation needs to be. Thanks, Annie. Um, it really breaks it down, doesn't it? Just like if you relating it to like the file structure, for example, we say um, at our organisation, which isn't super nice, but if someone was to go out and get hit by a bus tomorrow, mm. um, would we be able to still access their you know, work or, you know, would we have all that knowledge? Because a lot of that knowledge is just sitting in someone's head um, and, you know, getting it down on paper kind of makes it real and it really just scratches that surface. We've got some questions from the audience and um, I've got a few of myself, but I might go to the ones that we've got in the audience first. So Ernie, kind of breaking that down into what you've just gone over into really operational um, terms, can you describe the process of how um, you come up with that list of intangibles? Like how do you compile your initial list when looking at, you know, when you really are starting to value that intangibles? And do you re review the processes or look at categories first? Thanks, Tim White, for the question. Okay, so um, the best way to answer that is to engage the your leadership team and ask them that question. Um, what if, what if something happened? What if, and you start with people. I always start with people. What if, if uh, identify who your key staff are, and what if that person, um, you know, just won lotto and decided to resign the next day what would happen to your team to your business to your business unit can you list down the things that make that person so important in the business and you start with that you've got to start with the people because that's the inventory that goes home at night they're the ones who are bringing adding value that's untapping the potential for the business and examples of that could be i'll use one in engineering so we we have a <clears throat> very manual, excuse me, <clears throat> a manual way of doing our drawings for certain product product category. One particular individual worked out that he could develop a bit of code that would automate the different sizes of the product and essentially take out three work three weeks worth of work for two other people by simply automating the whole process and it would spit out all the drawing files. So, so for that individual, for that um, manager, he said, well, I've got to get that that program. I've got to somehow download it and make sure it's backed up. And I understand what code he used to design it to start with. And and is it editable? Uh, can someone else in the business be trained to to use it, to manipulate it? Um, and, and has he got it on a thumb drive? Has he got it on his C drive? Uh, should it be backed up? Should I? How do I how do I do that? And so when you ask that question, you'd be surprised what your team will come up with. And you have to ask it at all the levels, because like I said, the supervisor I had in the, in the warehouse that was running the assembly team, we knew that there was someone building roof racks that were building it 
by looking at his at his personal phone to work out what parts went with what, because that particular product was missing a bill of material. So when you when you empower the team, you'll get an enormous list of ideas, but it also makes them think about, well, the reason I can't have that person leave is because of this. And there starts the journey. And then it's about diving deep into that and asking more questions. And each person obviously will unpack that. That's their job, right? They'll start to say, well, if we documented this or we did a set of proper work instructions, then now they're available and then we'll make sure they're available on the on the server so that when we employ new people, we can train them on that. And by the way, we'll make that particular employee the trainer. Because he's shown a particular skill that we never identified before. So I hope that's a bit of an example of how that was a real life example for, for everyone. Definitely. I just want to touch on that um, $255 million sale of Rhino yeah. Rack to Chloris. Um, so obviously intangible assets come into that as Tyler, you know, was mentioning before with Instagram, um, it kind of really increases the value. How can you talk us through how, um, intangible assets kind of ensured that transaction? And again, like Tyler said, um, the traditional methods of valuation were employed by, um, you know, your big four in terms of coming up with a number. The additional um, gap that made up that 255 was around, so how do we scale your business? And so one would say, oh, we'll just get another facility, but it's it's about those processes of how do we develop new product in these markets for those markets? Well, if you've got a good process, you've got good systems and they're documented and they work, and you've got a good supply chain that you can scale or you can you can move um, or you have that mix, uh, you know, that, that special powder that or mix that makes up your product that you've got the secret recipe for that you can go and engage another another manufacturer, then that's where the discussion led to. We can scale this business. So and this is and, and being able to articulate how you're going to do it is the secret. Because you can't just say, oh, we've got these intangibles and this is how we use them. You have to walk through your potential buyer and actually articulate how you'll do it because that ends up forming your strategic plan. And then it's about execution after that. So being able to articulate that in quite some detail is the secret. And so going back to what Taylor was saying, being well prepared is also a very key part of you know, going through that process. If you're not prepared, they find the gaps. If they find the gaps, then that devalues your position. So being able to reinforce that you are ready, that you have these things in place, that you are also developing more intangibles, regardless of what the outcome is, gives that buyer or your partner um, the confidence that this is really just a execution question now. Do we want to execute? Do we want to unlock the potential of this business? And that makes the discussion so much more um, palatable for the buyer. And that's where we focus a lot of our attention, because obviously from, from the experience I had is they want to unpack that. They're very interested in making sure it's not just a, a you know, a comment or a, or a line item or a PowerPoint presentation. You really have to be able to dive deep and unpack it in some sort of detail. And just on that kind of valuation, Tyler, this might be a question for you. Um, so when when is the right time? Like when is too early or too late to get that valuation done? I know there's a lot of startup founders in our alumni that are heading into a capital raise or, you know, some are starting to think about exits. So when should you get that valuation done? Um, <clears throat> the valuation is is particularly around the an event. Right. So you need to have some sort of a capital event or capital raise or exit or merger or something when you would want the full valuation done. Um, but in the in the preparation leading up to that, it's never too early to just start the process to identify those intangibles and start to categorize what you have to start to get them ready. And those don't have to be all tied into one. You don't have to do, 
you know, sort of your audit and foundation process to get everything ready at the same time as your, your valuation. So I would say it's never too early to get ready because it's like keeping your house in order as you're building it, as opposed to waiting to sell it. And then you have to spend weeks and weeks deep cleaning everything. Just keep it clean and keep your house clean along the way. And it, it makes the process a lot easier when you come to transactions because the valuation engagements, you know, we probably take about six weeks on average, right? To, to do the process. If it's a really big transaction, it might be eight weeks. So it, it doesn't take a whole lot amount of time, but, um, you know, hopefully that's helped in terms of an idea of timing when you should go out and get that started. So just on that, we've got a question from the audience from Kenya Court. So how effective would it would be, would an intangible valuation be for a startup business who's got a really strong tech focus? Well, if you, especially a tech company, um, what are you valuing? If you're not valuing your people, your platform, your software, you probably are very similar to Instagram. You have no tangible assets. Um, you might have a couple of laptops, maybe a server that you're running and everyone working from home with COVID days. So you may not even have a physical location. Um, if you can't articulate those intangibles, um, <clears throat> then the a buyer or the person that's going to put the value on your business, they're gonna have to take your word on it, especially for early stage startups. So that's why you see kind of in that, you know, the really, really early stage, sort of the friends and family and fools round, those valuations can be high or they can be low based on the, the charisma of the CEO and how they present and, you know, very, very unrelated to financials in some cases. The best thing you can do is have something in your hand that helps to defend that the best possible. So if something goes wrong and they go, well, I didn't really like the way you answered that question, they don't just get turned off immediately. You've got some other something else other than just a pitch deck and, and your, your good sales pitch and your nice smile to convince them to put money into your company. So it can mean the difference of investment or not. So that's that's good to, even if you are going into that pre-seed round, it doesn't need to be, you know, a really late stage. It's good to have that valuation documented even for a pre-seed. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and the timing is shorter. We don't have to do complete in dive depth of 10 business divisions. We're just looking kind of at maybe five or six people. And, you know, so the process is cheaper, it's faster, and it doesn't have to be like, um, you know, a painful process. Great. So I've got another one here from Simone. What are the key risks to achieving a valuation that corresponds with what you as an owner or founder think the business is worth? For example, how much is a valuation likely to be affected by things like ensuring you have ownership of your own IP intangibles, key people in the business are locked in or are incentivized to stay in the business or key customer supplier relationships are protected? Uh, I actually think you know, Ernie's probably better to answer this because he just went through it <laughs> and he saw what was originally offered in their deal. And then they started talking about intangibles and what the final offer was. So obviously they went through risks and they knew what the founder was willing to accept. And so there's, there's a very big sort of difference in those sometimes. If, you, if you're playing for a target valuation uh, in, in just putting the numbers to meet this, it's going to fall apart. Um, so you have to build it up. I mean, Ernie, what was your experience through that sale process? Yeah, I, um, to answer that question, your, your key people, and that was one of the one of the opening comments uh, when I presented uh, to the buyer was, um, you know, having those key people and the knowledge, um, not just sitting within them, but sitting within the business. Um, again, you know, uh, extracting that and making sure the, the business owned that. So you talked about um customer lists um so if you're going to have a customer list you also it's you should also have a contract in place because you know how long does that that relationship last and that shows that uh you know you've taken that customer seriously and you also got some repeatable business so um you know i'm sure everyone's heard about the handshake deals um they don't work anymore right they don't give uh they don't instill your buyer uh, with confidence that, that that that's going to exist in 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 a month, two years time. But to be able to say, well, here's my customer list, here's my agreements in place, um, here's the process for evaluating those agreements on a yearly basis and renegotiating, um, and here's how those relationships have grown over time, is very important in terms of giving confidence uh, to your potential buyer. 
that you've got those again i'll go back to those processes in place right because that's what gives them the confidence that they're going to pay the model so very important to answer that question thank you another one from kate gardner how do you identify what intangible assets are already contributing to your basic dcf ev value and what are add-ons next level and how are the add-ons actually valued essentially negotiation or mini dcfs for future monetizations good question and you are you are you've got the right direction in terms of when we break down a company in terms of the the intangibles in your mini dcfs approach so we always start with a a traditional quantitative approach a numbers approach whether it's a cost approach or a, an income approach like dcf to, to give us a, a starting point then we'll typically use another valuation approach to get us another data point now when you get into the intangibles you start to slice and dice those and take them apart from one another okay so what you do is you take the brand for example now there's known valuation methods for brand like a relief from royalty you split that out okay then you take something like um your customer lists and you might do a evaluation approach that's called an, uh, an excess earnings approach or multi-period excess earnings approach depending on the, the terminology you use and then you use that and then you have basically a collective um shared bit which is you know your your contributory asset charges that kind of helps to split out which elements were attributed to which assets which costs are attributed to which assets when you stack all of those up it's kind of like a build-up approach you've got your brand your customer lists, your team, your relationships and networks. And you, you see that build up approach and you then can say, oh, well, this is what's actually contributing most to the value. And sometimes that approach can be much, much higher than just a traditional DCF and you can see the major differences. So once you've done that exercise, it helps to break down which assets are, are contributing. And um, sometimes it is, it's a little, it's a bunch of mini DCFs um, but it just depends on the assets and how they're how they're employed in the business. Thank you. And Jeff has asked once. So this is for Ernie. Once you identify intangible assets, such as a process to design your new roof rack, how do you quantify that value and where do you show it? Do you show it on your balance sheet? Where do you show it? It's a good question. Um, so for our for our situation, being able to have a quite a robust process um like a um an mpd process um that we could scale by adding people and they just follow it uh, for us it uh it would speak to market so that's how we measured the value of that process and the effectiveness of it so you think about a new vehicles launched um into the country uh we're all we're all kicking off at the same time and if we get product to market um or first to market through the through the process that we've employed um, the dealers that receive the product um, they're the ones that end up pushing the product the reputation then follows through that and the pattern of spend then follows so we're able to it's it's complicated you can't just put a number next to it but we we uh, we attributed value to that in terms of the growth that we're able to get every time we released a new product so that's how that's how we looked at the potential value of that particular process and obviously everything is connected right so your supply chain has to be up to speed uh, your, you know your, your capability of delivery your freight providers they all have to work in conjunction but ultimately we measure that through revenue and growth within our network were we taking market share and that's how we we put a value to it were we actually taking market share let me, let me add one additional little piece to that, because I think it is important that people understand, like we like I talked about in those two cases, if Rhino Rack builds a new product and they spend, you know, a thousand dollars of R&D time on it, right? They have the option to expense that or capitalize that. OK, if it is a, a particular project, if it has been identified as a um, as an internal project, they can put that on the balance sheet. But that depends on what their plans are from a tax strategy, from a growth strategy. And so that's more of a finance discussion uh, in terms of if they really want to put it on the balance sheet or if they're just looking for um, more value down the road and that may not come into play from a balance sheet perspective. So talk to your accountant 
and talk to your CFO in terms of strategically which projects and elements um, should be capitalized and should be expensed because um, it can it can change that significantly. Um, things like data sets, things like uh, I worked with a company that did um, medical trials, right? And and those get more and more valuable with time. And so, but they take a lot of money and effort up front. And if you expense those off, you'll have might have nothing to show for it. Um, but then again, you have to be able to defend it and prove that it's worth it. So have that discussion and make sure you have that plan in place with your, your accountant and your CFO. Tyler, I'm um, curious to know, um, what would you say are some of the most common mistakes you see in valuations? Um, for startups, uh, the most common is, well, you know, Instagram just raised a billion dollars and I have a similar platform, so I'm a billion dollar company. You know, just comparing or using the market approach to something where you have no clue of what the other company is and you're trying to use that as a market comparable, it's very, very common. And, you know, when a client comes to me and says, hey, they got a valuation at a billion dollars, there's another platform that's half a, half a billion dollars, another company that's 500 million or 200 million, can you value me at 200 million for my raise? And I go, well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, for under the uh, ethical rules of, of, of the, you know, uh, the International Valuation Standards Council, I'm not allowed to tell you, well, I can tell you what your value is going to be before we do the work, or I can guarantee you that you're going to be worth $200 million. You might be worth nothing because you're just copying what's already in the market or you're using all open source software. And there is nothing unique or different about your business um, at this stage. But it's hard to tell owners that. And so I think that's the most common misconception of, of comparing early on. And Ernie, to that, um, I would ask, you know, we were talking about it a little bit earlier and, um, in terms of the process of learning and understanding what is valuable in your company. What would you say has been the most valuable lesson in that process of learning about intangibles and then implementing behaviors within your team at Rhino Rack. Um, you did mention filing systems before, um, but are there any other examples or hacks you would say that help to identify and protect that um, within the company? The, the key for um, this topic, because again, being an intangible means it, it's, it's not always evident um, that it's floating around your business and it makes up such an important part. Um, so, once you've got your leadership team on board and even, you know, the middle management, this is something that doesn't reside or is owned by those leaders of the business. It's something that needs to be um, shared amongst the entire in the entire group, right? Because, you know, we've always heard the term, you know, confidential information. Well, that applies to everyone in the business. You know, so we, we have a policy here that we are in an open plan space. I sit in the open here. My screen's open for everyone, but everyone's aware how important the information that might be sitting on my computer is right now. And so that that reinforcement, that education, and you do that with your teams, with your HR uh, people to support it through, um, you know, even obelisks around the office that actually say intangibles are our, our, our uh, most important asset. You know, these constant reminders, you bring them up in your management meetings, you bring them up in your daily meetings at all levels of the business, using the language, using examples, um, pointing them out and celebrating when someone says, oh, look, I've, I've done this. Uh, we call them red beads. Um, identify the red beads in the business, which are things that are mixing the mixture. So they're almost like the oil, uh, the drop of oil in your water supply, uh, the, the contaminant. So let's identify those red beads. They're intangibles. They lead to a better business. And then being able to use terminology and examples that resonate throughout the business. So I can't reinforce enough how this is this is where the job of the uh, the leaders of the business have to continually just reinforce that messaging and uh, and highlight and obviously then record. And uh, it's part of your induction. Um, you know, when you onboard new people that you actually educate them from the beginning. All right. So um, there's really no no simple way. It's not a set forget and then let the business get on with its normal day to day operation. It's it requires energy. 
And uh, that term, the intangible asset, is is a is a new term. And I love the example of uh, of Instagram. And it was funny when when Taylor put it up. Those numbers, the two hundred fifty thousand dollars, the twelve staff, the one billion dollar value, that's ingrained in my head, and I use that all the time because it shows. It's a great example for your engineering division, for your marketing division, the quality of your database. Uh, I think before we kicked off today, um, Dallas will, and, uh, and yourself, Samantha, were talking about uh, the importance of uh, influencers and, uh, you know, um, and making sure that you, you actually pick the right, the right assets. Um, it, you've got to, you've got to filter that stuff through. There's no easy way to do that, but you, you, you need to then turn that into a, how does how does that influence to create content that creates hits on my website, which creates an inquiry through my dealer that creates a sale? When you can start to link all those things, that's when you've that's when you've got it. And then when you can do that throughout the entire business, what's the next thing we should be looking at? And but, but, but that you... takes that takes time. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and with your experience, Tyler, do you have anything to add to that? You know, when you're meeting with companies and going through these processes in terms of that, um, you know, that curve, that learning curve? You're me, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> We've had to happen once. Someone, someone was going to do it, so. Um, yeah, actually, I think... Um, I was reading the comment or the question that just came in from Tim White into the chat box, and it says, you know, how do you instill ongoing focus on intangible laws and on intangibles? And I think that's that's basically the question is, how do you really get the team to to keep doing that regularly? Um, two two examples here. One, uh, the the principal that, that I talk to when we go through one of our engagements, and um, it, we call it the wicket or the uh, the, the white fence, uh, the picket white fence. OK, now when you build a house, OK, some people will put a white picket fence around it. OK, it's going to keep people from walking across the lawn, maybe some dogs and cats out and things. And it kind of puts us on like, OK, well, yeah, that's protective. That's the property. Right. And it also sends a sign being like, hey, I, I value my property. I want to protect it. And this is the, this is the boundary. This is where it is. OK, if you don't do that, people kind of walk all over the place and 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 may walk across it and and. If someone was really, really malicious, they can get in and, and steal something from you. But the point is, is that white picket fence around your property is going to keep 95% or 99% of the, the danger and risk out. Now, with your employees and with your management teams, like Ernie was saying, if you bring it up, you're starting to build a white picket fence. If you put it in an email and send it out, you're building another piece of the fence. You know, as you talk about it regularly with your management teams, your employees, your onboarding process, even your offboarding process, someone leaves the, the business, you know, that's another one. Hey, stuff that you've developed and you created here well, as an employee here are actually property of Rhino Rack. The designs, the, the, the knowledge, the numbers, everything here, you know, that is not to be taken to a, a competitor. Even if they have a non-compete in their, in their employment contract or something, having that discussion is another white picket fence around your property that keeps people aware that this is important and it's going to help reduce costs or reduce issues. And the other side is a strategic opportunity. When you identify that you have really good processes and systems in place and your competitors do not, okay? He, the, the, the case is, you know, Tesla having chips of, to be able to continue production. That's an excellent example. It brings to mind another one when uh, early days of the iPhone, okay? Um, iPhone and Samsung were having a big battle back and forth. And um, uh, Tim Cook knew that on their launch before Christmas, there was gonna be a big rush for um, iPhone sales, okay? Well, there was logistics companies that he used and there were certain airlines that shipped it from their manufacturing plants over, okay? And they happened to be in the same locations as Samsung's, okay? They actually pre-booked airplanes so that they had the capacity and overbooked so that the competitor couldn't ship their product on time. So when you went to a store, you could buy an Apple and the new Samsung wasn't available because there wasn't any capacity or it wasn't on shelves yet. And part of that was because Apple had purchased all of the shipping for that 
you know, eight weeks that they knew it was going to be critical. They planned ahead. They knew it was a strategic um, intangible asset. They had the, the supply chain available and ready to go. So they bought it, kept the competitor out of their space. Very, very good way to use intangibles as a strategic element, the same way that Tesla with having enough chips for continued production is. So. Great. Um, I just want to kind of touch on ag tech. Um, so in a lot of the agri-tech startups we work with, um, data farming is massive. Data is involved in, you know, everything with farming. And a lot of farmers now, like if they're putting an agri-tech product on their farm, they want to kind of, you know, the data that they're getting, well, they want to also have a byproduct, you know, of that. So I'm just not sure what my question is, but my question is around like what what should these agri-tech startups who are getting all this data and start thinking about if they're not really, haven't really touched the um, surface of intangibles? Because I know, you know, all that question always goes around is who owns the data? Is it the producer? Is the startup? But, you know, is it, should we be diving deeper into those intangibles in that area? Uh, you know, from my side, as I look at companies that are coming into to new spaces, if you're an ag tech company, for example, um, I, I work with a, a, an incubator out of Singapore um, with, with agri-tech companies, right? And one of the questions that I ask when I go through each cohort, I run a session and I ask, you know, so what type of company are you? You're here with, as an ag company, right? But is that who you actually are? And are you a product company? Are you an R&D company? Are you a data company? Are you a platform or software company? Answer that question first. And then... I show them a slide that shows, you know, if you're a product company, you might sell for a four to five times multiple. If you're a software company, you might sell for a seven to eight times, uh, you know, EBITDA multiple, right? If you're a platform company, you might sell for 15 times an EBIT multiple. So then I ask them the question, where do you want to end up as your company? And the, the discussion really changes. So positioning and understanding which assets are going to be important at the end of their growth plan is very, very important. So for the ag companies that are keeping the data and they say, look, if you were ever going to use that data to become a data play, if you're going to use it to be a partner, you, knew, you, know, you need to make sure that that's clean, it's well kept, and it's maintained so that you have the ability, the, those, the three elements that we talked about, you know, the technical factors and the legal factors and the risk factors around something like data, make sure that you look at those not just today and where you're collecting, but how you plan on actually commercializing your product or your company in, say, five years? Because it may be a different answer. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, Ernie, I think a cheap intangibles officer is something that's probably not present in, I don't know, if it's very, very slim. I know you were the first, but if, if there is any others, is this something, I mean, you would advise people to do? I'm actually starting to think, oh, God, after this conversation, we definitely need one. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I mean, what's your day to day in that role and is it something other people should really start thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, after the, the acquisition, I mean, I was appointed the general manager of, of the Ryan Rack in Australia. Um, but I still obviously drive, um, that intangible, um, asset, uh, role. Um, and I still hold that role because it's so important in terms of unlocking that value in the business. And I wanted to keep the title. I mean, it was easy to say, well, let's just pass it on to someone else. They've, they've had the training. Uh, they've been through it. But I consider it to be such an important role in the beginning. Um, and I, I still believe we've got so much more to unlock in our business in terms of um, the true value that we uh, we offer. And, and, you know, you just talked about the database. One of our key initiatives after we did the um, the program with Everage was how important um, owning and uh, having um, the contact details and of our end consumer was because the business in in Australia is um, B the B the B um, you know we we sell to distributors and they had the contact details of the consumers that were ultimately buying our product. And so really after we did the foundation program, we realized that we, we're not even sure if we're talking to the right people. So we, we, we went to, into, a, into a different mode of now let's start acquiring 
um, you know, information about who our end consumer was so that we can actually get insights into what they think of our product, what they think of our brand, what sort of activities involved in, um, you know, are they into overlanding? Are they more into, um, you know, cycling and kayaking? How do we market when we release a particular product? All those insights, we're missing that. So it's really important that um, all businesses identify that that is a key role in their business today. It like like having IT, but more important because um, it does drive that cultural change. It makes you rethink about what's important in a business at all levels. And so I think, um, you know, for leaders of a business who are sitting in in this in this uh, talk today, you've, you've pretty much got one foot through the front door already. The fact that you have shown some interest, um, it's basically diving in boots and all. And uh, and just leading that charge for the for the first few years. And like I said, we're in our, you know, we had the presentation two or three years ago now, and uh, we're unlocking so much more that we never even thought of. And it's because that constant drive, and it always starts from the top. Um, so I can't emphasise it enough that that role does have to sit with the leader of the business in the beginning. And I'm still not at the point where I think um, I would relinquish that role. Um, to someone else, because I think there's so much, so much more to, to, to unlock and, and unpack within our business today. Great. And just to wrap up, I mean, thank you both for today. I think it's been a really valuable session and it has been recorded, so I can send it around to everyone so they can kind of take it in further. But I just want to know, you know, from you both, what's your number one tip, I guess, for people on the call that kind of want to take that next step? I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> um, look, number one tip for somebody who's starting that that journey, um, it doesn't have to be a huge undertaking, you know, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to take an, an, a crazy amount of time. Start with your management team and just get behind a whiteboard and just say, what are intangibles? Let's get a list. Let's, you know, request the list from Everedge and then let's just start to break them down. And let's see what we can do ourselves, right? Start the conversation and you'll see it just starts to snowball from there. And the more you unpick the, you know, the 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 ball of twine, the longer and longer the, the job becomes and you'll see. Um, but just getting that started can help you to, un, you know, identify some of the early, early wins. And so you might get the low hanging fruit very, very quickly. So it can be very, very profitable when you identify what your intangibles are and how you can strategically use them or where the major risks are. And you might be able to pick up those without advice or expert help from us. Of course, we'd love to sit down with you and go through a, you know, um, a session with you to work through. Um, but of course, it doesn't have to take time and money and energy uh, you know, that you may be expecting. Uh, so start off yourself and, and see how it goes. Yeah, I think um, what Taylor, Tyler, you just mentioned there is is really the essence of how you start. It's not a complicated thing. And uh, you know, if I could share how I kicked it off, it was a it was a whiteboard, and uh, I use a mind map, you know, color couple of color textures, and I basically said, here's Rhinorak, here's the finance department, here's engineering, here's a, our R and D, um, here's our operations team, split them up again and said, all right, guys, let's start with people. Who are your highest risks? What what would that what would the consequences of those people not being in the building uh, create for you? Start with that and then move on to the next thing. And before you know it, the team starts to unpack it. The key thing for me was um, the education piece. I think it's important to get a high level overview of what intangibles are versus non intangibles or the tangible, sorry. Um, just so the definitions are right, so people can, okay, a bill of material, got it. Um, how I put that product together, that that process roadmap, that's got it, I understand that. Now do another example for your finance team, you know, your database. Um, for IT, it's about the infrastructure and the agreements with your providers. Um, what happens if the internet drops out or that dark fiber that we installed, uh, you know, someone digs a hole and, and, and cuts the dark fiber that you've just installed. Do you have backup? What would you do if you had to resolve that? 
and then you do that before you know it they start to get the the penny does drop for each and every one of them and you have to for me it's identifying as the chief intangible asset um role is to is to relate an example that would actually cause them a lot of grief what what would keep you from sleeping at night what are those things operationally and then before you know it they're doing the job and then it's just about supporting and reinforcing and then with the assistance of uh, average they can unpack that even further because they can then dive deeper within the within the particular teams and then and then really that's when you start to get to the next phase when you start to unlock that true value you know how valuable is that you know hundred thousand uh, um, list of people or influencers that I've got well, how does that turn into value I mean that's that next part but for me it's about just identify what those key things are and the risk if they were to leave uh, or not exist and uh, and we've had examples of where servers have crashed and we've lost parts of our data set that ran our website. Do you think that was important for us? Absolutely. People couldn't see our products. There's one good example. So. Well, thank you both very much for today. I can't wait to send this recording around to my own organisation and kind of start that conversation, I think, as well. Um, so everyone who, who's on the call, we've got our next session will take place on the 4th of November and we'll be joined by Michael Masterson, the Managing Director at Everedge, um, and also Sarah Cross, who is the Head of IP Strategy at Fonterra. We'll be looking at doing a commercialisation boot camp, really um, determining what commercialisation strategy is right for your business, unlocking value through licensing agreements and how to mitigate the risk of your IP being stolen as you um, expand. So thank you, Ernie and Tyler, for today. It's sure. been a really great session, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful thank you, week. Guys. Appreciate the organization. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great week. Bye. Bye for now.